Hello, everyone. Hello, we're going to get started. It's so good to see your faces today and to be in such wonderful company with all these outstanding authors. So welcome to the San Francisco Public Library. I'm Shauna Sherman, manager of the African American Center. And we are so glad to be once again hosting the American Book Awards with the Before Columbus Foundation and this time, this year in its 44th year. So before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the library is located on the area now known as the San Francisco Peninsula, which is the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. If you didn't already know about the African American Center, it is a space dedicated to celebrating and promoting the culture, history, and, and culture and history of African Americans. We collect books, we partner with community, we host exhibits and programs like this awards ceremony. We are located on the third floor of the main library, and all the books in the center are now also available for checkout. So please visit, visit the center if you have some time today. And at the San Francisco Public Library, the center is just one place that holds space for the outstanding literature of our diverse community. So it's really an honor to be partnering again with the Before Columbus Foundation on this award ceremony. It seems like an appropriate place for it. Um, and congratulations to all the award winners with us here tonight. So before we get started, I'm going to bring the president of the Before Columbus Foundation up to the stage, Wajahid Ali. And I'll just tell you a little bit of, about him before I bring him up. Wajahid Ali is the New York Times contributing op-ed writer, an award-winning playwright, a recovering attorney, and a former consultant for the U.S. State Department. His writing appears regularly in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Washington Post, and the Guardian. He helped launch the Al Jazeera America Network as co-host of The Stream, a daily news show that extended the conversation to social media and beyond. As a playwright, Ali is the author of The Domestic Crusaders, the first major play about Muslim Americans post 9-11, which was published by McSweeney's and performed off-Broadway at the Kennedy Center. He is a Peabody-nominated producer of the series The Secret Life of Muslims, a, short, a series of short-form first-person documentary films featuring a diverse set of American Muslims. Ali was also the lead author and researcher of Fear, Inc., Roots of the Islamophobia Network in America, the seminal report from the Center for American Progress. Please join me in welcoming Wajahid Ali to the stage. Uh, thank you, Shauna. If I wasn't married, I could have scored two dates off that amazing introduction that my publicist probably wrote. Uh, Wajahat Ali would have sufficed, but I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the annual American Book Awards, proudly presented by the Before Columbus Foundation. As Shauna said, this is our 44th year. You give that round of applause. Thank you. We'll take a golf clap as well. Uh, and the first time since the pandemic that we're meeting in person, so it's lovely to see everyone's faces. And I would like to tell everyone that uh, babies are welcome. There's no shame. We love babies, so bring the baby back. Pets, uh, kids, elders. It is very deliberately and definitely an open forum for our communities. So do not be ashamed. Uh, the baby has a voice and the baby has something to say. Um, it, it is an honor to be the president of the Before Columbus Foundation, which is a very tasty title, which makes me sound much more important than I am. But what we all are on the board is basically cultural workers. At a time when we're living in the United States of America in the year 2023, where a library is one of the most dangerous places for some Americans. Some parents are more comfortable with their kids potentially getting shot at school or getting COVID than reading a book written by Toni Morrison. Too soon? Too soon? Uh, our librarians, our teachers, our educators are under threat and under attack by a right-wing group that is radicalized and weaponized and will do whatever it takes to take their country back and make it great again. The rest of us, the majority, are always chokeholded 
by their economic anxiety. And as such, our books must be banned, our stories must be banned. In some places that I won't name but might rhyme with Florida, uh, you apparently can say gay. Because if you say gay, it makes people uncomfortable. So don't say gay. And it's apparently it's like Beetlejuice. If you say gay three times, gays magically appear. I think that's the rules that apply. Um, but we have to censor ourselves, hide ourselves, not take up space, just so we don't let some people feel discomfort. And they would much rather ban our books to feel, not be, but feel comfortable. Even if that temporary feeling of comfort comes at the expense of justice, fairness, equity, accountability, or truth. And then everyone talks about, well, get to reconciliation. We just want reconciliation. And the question I have is, how do you get to reconciliation without truth? You can't, you don't, you won't. And with that, here we are at the San Francisco Public Library, at Coret Auditorium. Let's give it up for libraries and librarians who are literally doing their job under duress and threat. I'm not making that up. That's 2023 America right now. Uh, where we have a treasure trove of this thing called books. Scary stories. Things with words in them. Right? And these stories are so powerful and so scary that in the last two years, uh, there are certain forces in America that have banned over 2,000 books. I don't know if you've seen the videos, but in Tennessee, some lawmakers burned books last year with a blowtorch. Can't make it up. Uh, but they're also against cancel culture, so figure that out if you can. Uh, these books are predominantly written by people of color, black people, and LGBTQ communities. And so it's only fitting that here we are for the 44th Annual American Book Awards presented by the Before Columbus Foundation, uh, whose mission back in the day was to expand and stretch America to accommodate all the stories that were rendered invisible, that were banned, that were excised, that were put in the margins, and that were stereotyped. You need all of it. And, sadly, the same complaints and laments that were present in 1976 that prompted the birth of the Before Columbus Foundation, the American Book Awards, have come full, come full circle right now in America. Uh, I always joke that it's not a remake, but it's a reboot. The story happens again and again and again and again because the central story that some people need to maintain is a myth. The myth that America was birthed by the white Christian man. And sure, there were some savages here, but because of the white Christian man, they were able to pacify it. And this country belongs to them. And there were stewards of this land. And only once the other voices are pacified can America become great again. But there's also the Statue of Liberty and we're a country for everyone and all that other stuff. Uh, the rest of us try to fill in the blanks and the missing pages and to expand and stretch ourselves, our libraries, our workplaces, and hopefully our communities to accommodate the rest of the voices and to make space for the co-protagonists who never got the spotlight, who never got the girl at the end, who never got to save America, you know, people like me who were never on the billboards, people like me who were shot and killed by Chuck Norris in the 80s. Uh, uh, and if I, have to, if I can say one thing, with white supremacy, it's so insidious that when you watch yourself and your people getting blown up in the 80s and 90s, you root for Chuck Norris. And then years later, you're like, this is kind of racist and deeply troubling. I wish, I wish I was the hero of the story. And so today, we are celebrating heroes, men and women and people who have written stories under great duress, who have published stories under great duress, and who are being acknowledged for the gift of the words that have presented our communities. And the way it works, very deliberately, is there's no first place, there's no second place, there's no last place, very deliberate. There's no uh, losers, there are only winners you will see that the winners were chosen by our august board. Now, I want to name some names. I want to flex for a second because our board is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty awesome, all right? I'm going to name some names. This is the board. It's me. I'm nobody. I wear makeup on TV once in a while. But there are other folks. Uh, this young writer named Ishmael Reed, up-and-coming writer. 
uh, Viet Tan Nguyen, uh, Margaret Porter Troop, Sean Wong, Simon Ortiz, Nancy Mercado, Gundar Strauds, Jenny Lim, Juan Felipe Herrera, up and coming poet, Joy Harjo, there's talent there, uh, Victor Hernandez Cruz, Justin DeMong, Caroline Forche, Henry Louis Gates Jr., you'll see him on PBS once in a while, Sean Hill, Ishmael Hope, Marlon James, Leila Lalami, Nancy Carnival, Carla Brundage, Mitch Berman, and Mary Anderson. In that group, folks, there are MacArthur Genius winners, Pulitzer winners, Pulitzer nominated authors, Booker Prize winners. Folks have won all these fellowships with French names that I can't pronounce. Uh, Poet laureates of the United States of America. It's a big deal. And so the way it works in full transparency is we get inundated with books and poetry and we have to spend the entire year sifting through it. The board comes up with their selections. We all bring it forward to the board consensus. We hatch it out. It gets chiseled down. And these are the books that are selected. All right. Uh, the books that are selected, another cool thing about this is you'll notice that there are folks who are published by major fancy schmancy New York publishers. And then there are independent publishers. First time writers, celebrated writers, poets, journalists, publishers, editors, graphic artists, and novelists. So there is no quota system here, all right? There's no favoritism. You have been chosen due to your words. And so I hope that means something for all the award winners who are here assembled in this august company. And what you could give it, I like that golf clap. Let's give it up to them. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and finally, run of show, uh, my job is done. Uh, I come and give this speech. Uh, and then I introduce our master of ceremonies, uh, the man wearing the bow tie, Emil. And what's going to happen, he's going to kick it off. We're going to introduce each award winner. We're going to give you a very fancy schmancy plaque that Justin makes. It's expensive, so please cherish it. Uh, you're going to take a fancy schmancy photo. You're going to pose right there. Uh, think of your children. Think of Instagram. Pose well. Uh, this is being recorded. This will also be on C-SPAN. And for the winners, you get uh, three to five minutes, you know, you know. If you see some grumbling, that's the symphony telling you to, you know, brevity is, is a beautiful mistress that you should embrace at that time. Uh, three to five minutes, though. We're here to celebrate you. And to kick it off, let me introduce our MC of the day, Emil Guillermo, journalist, commentator, columnist in TV, radio, and digital platforms. He was the first Asian American host of NPR's All Things Considered in 1989. He writes a weekly column on race, politics, culture, and media that can be found on the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund website. His reality talk show is on www.amak.com. He hosts the PETA podcast. As a stand-up solo artist, he has performed his Amak monologues all across the country. His book, Amak, Essays from an Asian American Perspective, won the American Book Award in 2000. Not only is a winner, he's also the MC. Uh, he dropped out of Harvard because he's a good man. Uh, I'm just kidding. Some of our, f we love Harvard graduates. Some of our favorite graduates are Harvard graduates. Uh, but unlike Bill Gates, he returned for his degree and he just completed a New York run of Ishmael Reed's play directed by Carla Blank, The Conductor, where he played a conservative TV pundit. Give it up for your MC, Emil Guillermo. Wow, well, th thank you very much. You know. When they asked, they didn't even really ask me to do this. I said, I'm in New York, I'm doing this play. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to reprise my look of the conservative uh, pundit on TV? And so with the bow tie and the, because people who know me I know I'm not really all that conservative. So uh, it, that, that's what they call acting, acting it was. Uh, you know, Waj, that's a, thank you for that introduction. I realized when I sent it to you, I essentially just cribbed off the program notes, off the conductor, which was off, off Broadway. And I say off, off Broadway because I don't want people to be confused to think that, oh, you mean like El Cerrito? No, it was off, off Broadway. It was in New York City. And I, I cribbed off the, the notes. I really should have just used chat GPT because I, I went to chat GPT and I said, give me a short bio for Emil Guillermo. And this is what it said. I could not have paid a PR person uh, more. Emil Guillermo is an accomplished writer known for his insightful commentary and thought-provoking essays. With a career spanning several decades, he has contributed to various publications, including newspapers, magazines, and online platforms. I mean, this person really knows me. You know, Guillermo's work often explores topics such as race, ethnicity, and social justice, 
providing readers with a unique perspective on these issues. His writing combines a deep understanding of these subjects with a talent for engaging storytelling, making his work, work both informative and compelling. Guillermo's contributions to the world of literature and journalism have earned him a respected place in the field, exactly in the basement of the San Francisco Public Library here for the ceremony. No, I, I could not, this chat GPT, I'm, I'm in favor of chat, people who put down chat GPT. No, they're wrong, they're wrong. Anyway, uh, so I want to thank also Waj for pointing out that I did win this award in 2000, and I remember giving the speech in Chicago and during the, uh, the big book festival there and thinking, wow, what's gonna happen? And now I look back 23 years, my, my column is still uh, published by the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. You can see it at aldef.org slash blog. From 2013 to 2023, all 600,000 words of that, not all of them award winning, certainly, but they're there and it's out there for people. And if you count the years at Asian Week from 1995 to 2010 when they went under, that's like close to a million words of Filipino American, Asian American words that no one would have seen if there wasn't an ethnic media, if there wasn't an ethnic press, if there weren't people who said, hey, we ought to include these voices, this is America. And there it is. I mean, a million words isn't much, and not all of them are award-winning, but we did it. And that's what, of all the things in my bio, I'm proud to say, I am a writer, a writer of Asian American Filipino ancestry, and my words are out there for anyone who wants to find them. And I thank the Before Columbus Foundation for being here 44 years later and for being this presence to bring those words to people. And we honor today a woman who, the Lifetime Achievement Award goes to a woman, I, I don't think she remembers the words she put when she blurbed my book, but she blurred my book and they, they were the most important words on my book because they reminded me that I must honor my words. I must honor what I say. And these weren't just you know, things that were just off the top of my head. These were expressions from a real Asian American Filipino soul of the time, and they were important. And I look at the back of the cover and I see Maxine's blurb of my book saying, oh, Emil, he's fun. He's the first person I read when I read Asian Week. And I, I honor those words and I honor her today when we get to that point when it's a Lifetime Achievement Award. Maxine Hong Kingston. She may not remember, but I remember when she did, I just said, oh, she's the godmother of, you know, Asian American literature for generations. And uh, so anyway, that's coming up. Now, uh, one of the things is, this is a celebration. So we're gonna have a little party. I, maybe I'll tell some jokes somewhere. I, I, I did play this part and I reprised my costume, wore, wore, wore a bow tie and, uh, and these glasses. I thought maybe these, well, cause I'm reading some of these things I'm reading, but I, I also, there's a number of things that they wanted me to do. Uh, oh, first of all, this is a celebration of writers, right? And writers, especially on a Sunday, they should be home writing. They, they, they shouldn't be here, they, they should be writing. And, and so, actually, maybe they asked me to MC because a lot of people aren't coming today and they're not present, so they've asked me to vamp, and so I'll do that, but, the, the response to people who aren't here who are receiving awards is, well, of course, they're writing. They are writing. They're doing the most important thing that writers do. So they are, they are writing. Now, just before, and I'll just tell you a behind the scenes thing, uh, I was slipped a, a little statement from the founder of the Before Columbus Foundation. He said, no one knows uh, I've done this, but I want you to read this, and I'm very, honored to be able to read this statement from Ishmael Reed. In, 19, in 1976, when I founded the Before Columbus Foundation and invited Victor Hernandez Cruz to be the co-founder, I was reminded by the New York Times that I was a member of the establishment, having received recognition from prestigious literary organizations, having edited anthologies by that time, including Yardbird, Reader, a literary magazine, I was aware that there were writers, 
Native American, Hispanic, Black, Asian American, Irish, Italian, and Jewish Americans who wrote as well as me. Where was the recognition for them? This was the guiding spirit of the American Book Awards, which we began in 1980. Since then, scores of writers have received awards that have led to their promotions at institutions where they teach or have longer shelf life for their books. It wasn't long before the major publishers who ignored us at first began vying for our attention. A few years ago, the Washington Post called the American Book Awards the American League to the National Book Awards National League. On our board are two MacArthur Fellows, a Booker Prize winner, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and two former US Poet Laureates. We are the Writers Awards. Don DeLillo, John A. Williams, Gloria Naylor, and others have traveled to receive their awards at their own expense. But there were lean years. Gundar Strauss got us through them. A son of Latvian parents who were displaced by Soviet Union tyranny, Gundars knows the treasure of free expression. And the literary establishment selection of divas and devos from ethnic groups lessens the free expression of those who write as well as their tokens. Gundar started in our shabby office on 6th Street and attended American booksellers conventions nationwide. He was in New Orleans where the great Alan Toussaint performed for us, but our rivals persuaded the National Endowment to end our grants, a mere $16,000 yearly. I asked Gundars how we got through those years. He said, with blind persistence. If we've been around for over 40 years defying the warning of our critics that we'd be short-lived, it's because of the dedication to our purpose by Gundar Strauss and Justin Demangles. Despite Justin, let's hear it for Justin. <laughs> Despite a year of intense pain and surgeries, Justin manages the foundation. Not only has he worked our program, the American Book Awards, but programs that have honored great writers like Ted Jones and forums addressing topics that address the concerns of the literary community. There is no way that we can repay Demangs, who is probably in pain while sitting here. He wouldn't want me to tell you because he is no writer. So we want to thank both Gundars and Justin for their devotion to multicultural literature in a period when fascists are burning books, organizations like the Before Columbus Camp Foundation will, will see to it that literature survives as it has for thousands of years while book banners have risen and fallen. Signed, Ishmael Reed. Thank you, Ishmael. So Ishmael's right here. Ishmael, wave to the crowd. Wave to the crowd. Like I said, honored to read his words, but I read his words in the play, and he gave me more laugh lines in the play. So, all right, so here we are. So, as I said, we're going to go with uh, our first award, and it's Ayana Lloyd Banwo. She is not here. Ayana Lloyd Ban Banwo, when, when We Were Birds, is a novel, and uh, she's a winner from Trinidad and Tobago, currently living in London. Her debut novel, uh, was a 2023 winner of the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature and the Authors Club Best First Novel Award. So let us honor uh, When We Were Birds, Ayana Lloyd Banwa. Right. Uh, the second person, Edgar Gomez, uh, he also is not here because we know, as I said before, he's a writer. He's probably writing now. He's probably writing. Uh, Edgar wrote the book, High Risk Homosexual, a memoir, sassy. Uh, he's a Florida-born writer, so imagine how, how well this goes off in Florida. Right? With roots in Nicaragua and Puerto Rico, he's a graduate of the University of California, Riverside. Give it up for Riverside, the Inland Empire, uh, where he received an MFA. Uh, his words have appeared all over LA Times, Poets and Writers, 
uh, the New York Times. The New York Times, in fact, called him a breath of fresh air because the New York Times knows it needs a breath of fresh air. It was the best book of 2022 by the Publishers Weekly. Uh, we are honoring it, high-risk homosexual, a memoir, and unlike uh, some others, Edgar did send a note. So it's a good thing that I played a role in Ishmael's uh, play, because now I can act. This is Edgar Gomez. Hello, everyone. I really wish I could be in San Francisco with you all to celebrate and can't tell you how honored I am that my memoir, High Risk Homosexual, is the recipient of an American Book Award. When I was writing my book, I had to fight the voice in my head that told me that there was no room in the publishing industry for a queer Central American memoir. This award proves to me, and hopefully to others like me, that there is room for us, and that if we dare to follow our dreams, there are people out there who want to see us winning. Not writing, he said winning. Thank you, Edgar Gomez. Edgar Gomez. All right, what, what, is, what is next? Oh, now we have, you know, this is the thing they, her book is called Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. And let me just read a little about, about her. She's a professor of history, African American, African American uh, Studies and Urban Planning at UCLA, where she holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History. And we gotta mention that so that she'll, so her, her checks won't bounce. She is a, 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 an endowed chair. She directs the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies. She's one of the nation's leading experts on race, immigration, and mass incarceration. Let's uh, welcome the winner of an American Book Award, Kelly Little Hernandez. Okay, if I, if I can read from the, uh, from the synopsis, Bad Mexicans tells the dramatic story of the Magonistas, the migrant rebels who sparked the 1910 Mexican Revolution from the United States, led by a brilliant but ill-tempered radical named Ricardo Flores Magon. The Magonistas were a motley band of journalists, miners, migrant workers, and more who organized thousands of Mexican workers and American dissidents to their cause. So, Bad Mexicans, Kelly Little Hernandez, winner of the American Book Award. All right, next, it's Everett Hoagland, uh, The Ways, Poems of Affirmation, Remembrance, Reflection, and Wonder. And Everett Hoagland is an emeritus professor of English at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. He was the first poet laureate of New Bedford, Massachusetts in 1994. What took them so long? New Bedford. Uh, he, his work has appeared in numerous anthologies and several works. The Ways is a collection of mainly quiet and contemplative poems, most are new, written during the current pandemic, a winner of the American Book Award for The Ways, Poems of Affirmation, Remembrance, and Reflection, and Wonder, Everett Hoagland. Our, our next award, I'm going to introduce uh, Carla Brundage, who is accepting the award uh, for our next winner. Uh, the next winner is Anne Hyde. Uh, she wrote the book, Born of Lakes and Plains, Mixed Descent Peoples and the Making of the American West. Uh, Anne Hyde is a professor of history and editor-in-chief of the Western Historical Quarterly. Uh, her most recent work, uh, Born of Lake and Plains, Mixed, Descendant, uh, Mixed Descent Peoples and the Making of the American West was published by Norton in 2022. Uh, she, she says, or the, the, uh, as you will see in the program, often overlooked, there is mixed blood at the heart of America and at the heart of native life for centuries. There were complex households using intermarriage to link disparate communities and create prospective circles of kin. And this is the subject of Anne Hyde's book, Born of Lakes and Plains, Mixed Descent Peoples and the Making of the American West. Uh, to accept on behalf 
of Professor, Professor Hyde is Carla Brundage, poet, educator, and a board member of the Before Columbus Foundation. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be accepting this on behalf of Ann Hyde. Uh, it was incredibly uh, enlightening to read this book, which brought to light uh, many dynamics in the early history of the United States of America, especially in the Midwest, as um, revealing mostly the unknown parts that reveal how complicated a history actually can be. Um, her pathbreaking history kind of brings to light voices that have been muted, and she follows five mixed race families uh, of indig indigenous and many European um, descent who had formed these families and started businesses which of a brown trade and around the fur, and then when the Indian Removal Act comes, it's really interesting to read a book which is perfectly historically based and which reveals what happens when there is family connection and racial, um, I don't know, the excuse of using race to take people's stuff. So <laughs> that's how I wanna say it. Uh, during the pivotal 19th century, mixed descent people who had once occupied a middle ground became um, a racial problem, dis drawing hostility from all sides. Their identities were challenged by the pseudoscience of blood quantum, which many of us in this country have suffered for, and it's the instrument of allotment policy. Their traditions by the Indian schools are established to erase the native ways, and as Anne F. Hyde shows, they navigated the hard choices they faced for centuries by relying on the rich resources of family and kin. So it's a beautiful story, and I hope you all read it. For our next award, I'm going to have uh, the pre president, you know, I don't want to demote you, the president of the Fort Columbus Foundation come up and introduce our next winner, Waj Wajali, come on. And who is our next winner, Waj? Well, let's, uh, let's give it up to Emil, who has been preparing and waiting for this day for a long time. Uh, Carla and Ishma, I think you really need to give him uh, another role. Immediately. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, just coming along. You know, I know oftentimes when we do this in person, uh, we usually have all the winners, but right now uh, there's a COVID spike. And I don't know if you all have been noticing uh, in New York, infrastructure is having a problem. Uh, there are some leaks, so a lot of folks couldn't make it, but those who did, we appreciate you. And we actually have our first award winner who is here in person. So, uh, uh, high expectations, Jamil. Uh, Jamil John Kochai wrote a fantastic book which was recommended to me by Justin DeMong. The book is right here. The Haunting of Haji Hotek, a collection of short stories written by Jamil. And uh, Jamil is an award-winning writer from, I, I hope I could say from the Bay Area, uh, a refugee born in Peshawar, Pakistan, from Afghanistan, and then from Pakistan they moved to the Bay Area. Uh, even though English was not his first language, now he is an award-winning writer in English. Uh, and oftentimes when people talk about uh, Afghans, uh, we see horror stories, we see refugees, first from the, the Soviet invasion and then the U.S. invasion, uh, which was the longest invasion in U.S. history. And oftentimes what we don't see or what we don't hear from are Afghans. Uh, and we see them as stats, and we see them chasing airplanes, and then we say, oh, they helped us. Oh, it's so sad. Oh, inshallah, things will get better for them. Or we go to Fremont Boulevard in Fremont, California, my hometown, uh, or we go to Day Afghanan Kebab House and eat chapli kebab, and we're like, oh, these Afghans, they make really good chapli kebab, which they do, uh, and Bulani, uh, but we don't hear their stories. And so what Jamil does, in this collection of short stories, fictional, is uh, he talks about pain, 
He talks about trauma, he talks about disappointment, and he talks about how it is to live a, a life of dignity when you're not treated with dignity, how it is to survive in America and Afghanistan and Pakistan as the child or the descendants of unending war, what it feels like to play video games, uh, such as Metal Gear Solid, and then see uh, yourself playing in Afghanistan. Uh, what that happens. Um, and so these are stories that are not interconnected, but they stand alone, but nonetheless they paint a portrait of a peoples who have endured and survived and still continue to survive and thrive despite uh, going through so much pain. Uh, and it's done with uh, a lot of life and vibrancy and colorful language. And so it is my honor to award the annual American Book Award to Jamil John Kochai, who is a local writer. Jamil. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to thank the uh, Before Columbus Foundation for selecting my book for an American Book Award. It's such a tremendous honor. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's especially surreal to be sitting in the same room here as uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, um, a legend and, uh, and a personal literary hero of mine. Um, I want to thank my family for their stories, uh, my mother and aga, my aunts and uncles, my brothers and sisters who are always my first editors. Um, everything I write is written in the shadows of these great, incredible, funny, tragic um, oral tales that I grew up uh, hearing. Finally, I want to thank my beautiful wife, Nazifa, um, who agreed to marry me when I was just a broke, silly graduate student with too many dreams and too many bills and uh, without a publication to my name. And uh, now we, here we are together accepting an American Book Award. Uh, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say this. Um, Emil mentioned that he is a recipient of the American Book Award. For those who don't know, many, many years ago when I was a young man, uh, and I had actually uh, black hair, not gray hair, and was 10 pounds, eh, 12 pounds lighter, uh, I was a student at UC Berkeley. And my professor was Professor Ishmael Reed in a short story writing class. And there was another professor, um, a, a young writer by the name of Maxine, uh, Hong Kingston, yeah, yeah, young writer, uh, you might know. And uh, these were titans uh, when I was growing up, and I got uh, into Ishmael Reed's class, and Ishmael Reed told me, uh, a 21-year-old at that time, hey, don't write a short story, you should write plays. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, yeah, yeah, don't waste your time writing short stories. Look, uh, I think you're a playwright. You have a gift for characters and dialogue, so give me 20 pages of a play. You ever read Raisin in the Sun, Death of a Salesman, Long Day's Journey in a Night? I'm like, yes. Write me something like that. I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, look, 9-11 just happened. And as a black man, I could tell you that your people are going to get hazed. And the way that my people have fought back through 400 years is through art, culture, and storytelling. And so they can't take away your story. You're like Muslim in Pakistani, right? Write me a story of a play of a traditional kitchen uh, American drama, but from the perspective of a Pakistani Muslim American family. This was October 2001, folks. And that play then became The Domestic Crusaders, which the first person that came on to produce and help the play after I graduated from college two years later was Ishmael Reed as the first producer. His partner in crime, who uh, helps him and tolerates him, some would say, is Carla LeBlanc. She came on as the director. And Ishmael literally turned to Carla and said, hey, you should direct this play. And she goes, I should? She goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It'll be easy. Little did they know, they would spend the next eight years surrounded by Pakistanis eating my mom's biryani. And all this to say is the Domestic Crusaders, the, the first, if you will, group, the first collection of writers that believed in this play that nobody else believed in was the Before Columbus Foundation. That play eventually got off Broadway at the New York and Poets Cafe, got published by McSweeney's. And McSweeney's contacted me a year and a half ago on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and said, can we republish the play? And that was the play, if you remember, Carl and Ishmael, everyone said, who will want to listen to a play about Muslims and Pakistanis? The mainstream is not ready for ethnic stories. Karma is real, karma is brown, and karma is very petty. 
all of this is to say is that uh, all of us have humble beginnings and this is all to say for those who are in the audience and those who are listening because I know this will be on C-SPAN later, oftentimes all you need is one person, one teacher, one friend, one parent who says you got something, you have a story. And oftentimes many of us who were, had humble beginnings, I was also a broke-ass broke writer who married way up and, my, and I said inshallah one day we'll make it. And my wife's like, we better. Uh, you need someone to believe in you, and that's the wind that lifts the sails. And so anyone who's watching right now, uh, if you know someone in your family or community who has a talent, you could be that one person that helps them out. And if you think your time has passed, that's the beautiful thing about writing. If you could pick up a pen and write, it ain't too late. It ain't too late. And speaking about people who keep going and who persevere, uh, I, I say this in my introduction, uh, even though Ishmael has hinted at it, and I hope he's not embarrassed, our chairman of BCF is Justin DeMong. Did I pronounce it correctly? Justin, where are you at? All right. Uh, when, I, when I first read his name, uh, I thought it was Desmangles, because it's pronounced D, uh, it's, it's written D-E-S-M-N-A-N-G-L-E-S, but it's DeMong, much like when people say, I have a lot of interesting translations of my name. My favorite is Warbalot and, and Waja the Hut. Uh, but Justin DeMong, uh, single-handedly keeps BCF running. All right, this guy's the engine. Uh, before Justin, it was Gundars, and look what it did to Gundars. Uh, yeah, Gundars is barely alive, all right? Uh, before Columbus Foundation, if you don't mind me saying this, 44 years we've been running. If I showed you the budget, you would cry. Because here we have institutions in New York that have jumped on the DI bandwagon in the past three years. They've discovered something called multiculturalism. And as such, they've been getting six figures, sometimes seven figures, to do nothing. Uh, meanwhile, I think this OG crew of Ishmael and Victor Hernandez Cruz and all these other giants figured it out in 1976, folks. And they've been just running on prayers, fumes, love, and inshallah. Uh, and so, if you can, if you can, please consider donating to the BCF. It's a nonprofit organization, tax deductible. And in the absence of funds, the person who has kept it running is Justin. And I will say this, that Justin has had so many surgeries in the past year. Justin's foot is going through, you know, I, I believe in God. If you believe in God, send a prayer. If you don't believe in God, send a good goodwill to the universe that hopefully, inshallah, things work out for him. He's gone through so much stress, so much stuff. And as this guy's recuperating in the hospital, he emails me about the BCF. I'm like, bro. You literally in the hospital, you can't walk. Give BCF a rest for a day. He goes, no, man, the awards are coming up. I got to read this extra book. I'm like, Justin, the books can wait. He goes, American Book Awards, they're too important. Um, and so I just want us to recognize Justin, and if you can, give him some love and a round of applause because he, he made it happen. And Justin, in addition to being a lover of words, is also a lover of jazz music. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to the Twitters, otherwise known as X. Um, yesterday, there was a troll on Twitter, a check mark. Uh, this, troll, this tweet went viral. And it was just a right-wing troll who had a photo of John Coltrane. And he said, I've given jazz a chance. And I don't see the big deal about it. It's just a lot of gibberish and noise. And to which I, quote, tweet, responded, I knew I shouldn't have indulged the troll. But I said, oh, that's a shame. You're missing out on so much beauty. And so Justin DeMang is going to introduce Adian Levy. And I'll let him tell you all about this thing called jazz. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here this afternoon with us. Hey, Steve. Thank you for being here. One of the unique characteristics of black American literature is that it emerges from centuries when literacy was punished by death, right? So 
For hundreds of years, the African and the Americas who learned to read and write was risking their life. And so serious was this law taken to be that even those of you who had the courage to teach reading and writing to the African and the Americas, you were killed too. So what then is the relationship of this extraordinary, ordinary fact to African-American letters and music specifically? Well, obviously, the understanding of language as a technique of gaining and maintaining power is entirely different, right? The supple bend and flex and twist of the rhythmic propulsion and the sense of urgency in African-American letters emerges from this centuries-long space. But what would happen, or what did happen, under these circumstances were such that the history of many tribes and peoples and empires who were enslaved over hundreds and hundreds of years, that story, that archive, if you will, was then contained in the ritual action of the music. The music which contained the history of these many peoples and tribes, right? And that music, which contained the archive of this history, pre-Columbian, pre-European, African, stretching back tens of thousands of years, which could not be written down, taken down on tape or played back, informed what would become the archive of African American letters, but it begins there. It begins there. And so the masters of the music that we know today as jazz are those who bring forth the message that for centuries kept these communities spiritually intact to revive and resuscitate an image that was spiritually intact under these many centuries of slavery and uh, to be sure, always already contained an urgent and damaging critique of the institutions which developed around their enslavement. So this, in essence, is what informed the tradition of what we understand today as jazz. And as I said, the, the masters of this, this continue to bring that, continue to bring that forth. Now, in the historical biography of jazz as literature, there has been, um, to say the very least, an immense failure to contextualize and amplify this story. Um, after all, one of the theological propositions of slavery is that the African doesn't have a spirituality. So, part of Aidan Levy's great triumph and indeed, his biography of Sonny Rollins is a great triumph, is that this very gifted writer, Aidan Levy, gave us much more than a biography of Sonny Rollins. He, he deeply contextualized the story of Sonny Rollins and the story that I'm talking about today, which has to do with that continuum emerging over many, many centuries to amplify and uplift the message and the meaning of the music and that archive and that history, which also informs our literature and our art. And so it is a great honor to welcome Aidan Levy to the stage and to present the 44th American Book Award to Saxophone Colossus. Aidan Levy.
it's uh, such an honor to be here today with all of you. And um, first, I want to just thank the Before Columbus Foundation, which is an organization that um, I revere. I think its mission couldn't be more important in this moment when the humanities are under attack. Uh, I want to thank Justin DeMong and uh, Ishmael Reed, um, one of my literary heroes. I'm about to teach mumbo jumbo again um, to Columbia University undergraduates. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, just a few thank yous. Um, I'd like to thank the folks at Hachette Books, um, my agent, Russ Galen, uh, Terry Hinty, uh, Sonny Rollins' publicist. Um, I'd like to thank my family, um, my, my mom, Patty, my dad, Harlan, and my sister, Allegra. And uh, most of all, my brilliant wife, Caitlin Mondello, who is here with my daughter, Isabel, that you may be able to hear in the background. She seems to be filming this. Although I, it looks like she's bent over with the baby. I hope you're not changing a diaper. Um, I'd like to thank all of the interview subjects for this book. I conducted more than 200 interviews over the course of the book. So it was very much a communal effort to tell this story, uh, as well as the librarians and archivists. Uh, it's such a thankless job, and they really need to be thanked uh, more than they are. And we are in a library, of course, so I don't want to leave that out. Just so many archivists who contributed to this project. Um, most of all, though, I, I have to thank Sonny Rollins himself, who just a month ago turned 93. And he's uh, still keeping up the struggle. So a round of applause for Sonny Rollins. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave you with a, a couple thoughts about Sonny Rollins. One is that in the, in the early 60s, um, he would come out on stage uh, in a white cowboy hat sometimes. And he might start playing uh, songs that were made famous by Al Jolson or Bing Crosby or he could play something by the composer Edward McDowell um, of the McDowell Colony. Um, and then he might play his own composition, something like Olio. Um, he paid tribute to Miles Davis, to uh, Thelonious Monk, to Duke Ellington. And uh, then he would take off the cowboy hat, and underneath it, he had a mohawk. And this was before the punk movement. Um, he was really kind of the OG um, musician with a mohawk. And some people thought he was doing it just to be weird, but he was actually doing it to honor Native Americans. And uh, when Sonny went to Japan for the first time in, in 1963, he had the mohawk, and everybody was so uh, curious about it that it ended up dominating the press conference that he had there. Um, and when he came back in 1968, he didn't have it anymore. They didn't believe it was him. So he got another haircut. Uh, anyway, Sonny is an artist who is truly beyond category. Um, I think that, uh, th that's a phrase that Duke Ellington used. I think that he exemplifies uh, everything that the American Book Awards stand for. And I, I guess I'll just close with a quote from Sonny himself. This is something that he wrote 65 years ago for his album, Freedom Suite, which uh, if you haven't heard, I recommend that you listen to it tonight. Um, and it, it goes like this. Uh, America is rooted in African-American culture. It's colloquialisms, it's humor, it's music. How ironic uh, that the African-American people, who more than any other people can claim American culture as their own, are being persecuted and repressed. 
that African Americans who have exemplified the humanities in their very existence are being rewarded with inhumanity. Uh, that was what he wrote 65 years ago. Um, it's still true today. So I, I'd like to dedicate this award to Sonny Rollins, who as I said is still with us. He's still uh, keeping up the fight and um, he's truly an, an American hero and an American original. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aiden Levy. Well, you know, writers, writers can afford to be dishonest with the world. The Lord knows a lot of them are. But they can't afford to be dishonest with themselves. Not if they're going to write effectively. Not if the illumination of their mind is going to continue to light the way with the melody and the rhythm and the sound and meaning of their words. Oh, there's some jive-ass writers out there. But to write effectively, to be more than heard, to be read and read again, and to illuminate, writer can't afford to be dishonest with themselves. No. Bohan Lewis, Bojan Lewis? Bojan Lewis, yeah. Bojan Lewis has that honesty, that ring of truth, that oscillation between the inner and outer world that guides the reader towards a tremendous authority of feeling and undeniable sense of reality and wisdom as sometimes love is saying goodbye it's the sinking bell huh the sound and uh, this is actually uh, Bojan's second American Book Award, so um, we're deeply uh, grateful to him for uh, guiding us as well as his readers uh, towards a uh, broader sensibility and understanding of our world today and the uh, inner conflicts and unresolved mixed emotions of his characters that so, so eloquently speak uh, to the situation of his people, of our people, and of the world that we can possibly welcome ahead with that practical form of the imagination with its horizon set on freedom. Those are the, the things that come to mind when thinking about Bojan Lewis, and uh, he's here today. So please welcome the author of Sinking Bell, a collection of short stories from Grey Wolf, wonderful writer, Bojan Lewis. Yet, eh, to the American, uh, before Columbus Foundation. Um, I brought my family, uh, and we've just been chilling with some friends who live here. Um, great to be back in San Francisco. Guess what I'm trying to say is I, I thought I would be able to write something. Um, I'd have a toddler who just, you know, uh, takes all my attention. Uh, and my lovely wife, Sarah Sams. Um, thank you to her for always supporting me um, through my cranky bullshit, um, through getting sober, uh, through becoming a, a, a parent. Um, I couldn't have done it without them. Uh, and thank you to my daughter who is showing me how to be joyful 
and not such a pessimist, probably. Um, and thank you to all for being here, and thank you to all the other award winners. Your work inspires me. Your stories inspire me all the time. Um, I wouldn't be doing this without, without work like this. Um, I probably would have given up a long time ago. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so now we're, we've hit a groove, right? I mean, uh, we're almost halfway through. And uh, thank you very much, Justin and uh, Waj, for coming up. Uh, just, just, this is sort of like the, the Oscars, you know, where you have like co-presenters, but they, I don't get a wardrobe change, Ishmael. What, what's wrong? I'm wearing, maybe I'm, a slight change. I, I, I tweaked my tie. No, uh, I, thought, I thought that I would be the one who only talks or presents people who didn't show up. But I was, I was told that some people had really good excuses besides that they are, in fact, writing. For example, Everett Hoagland is actually very ill. So we, we, our thoughts and prayers to Everett. Um, he won for The Ways, Poems of Affirmation, Remembrance, Reflection, and Wonder. Other people, we just have to figure that they are writing, they're busy writing. Now, our next winner is an Oakland writer. Uh, Leela Motley, Nightcrawling, a novel, is not present. She actually did send me a statement, and I'll read this because I am an actor. Uh, Thank you so much to the Before Columbus Foundation for the honor of the American Book Award. I'm truly privileged just to exist on the same list as so many other incredible authors. It means so much to have Kiara and her story recognized in this way as a story centering black girlhood and the experiences of vulnerability in a world that so rarely allows us the luxury of softness. Thank you for witnessing this story, for reading it and sharing it and finding something in it. I'm immensely grateful, Leela Motley. Now, that was Leela's statement, but I know someone came up to me and said, Leela is a great writer, and I got something to say about Leela. And he's on the board of the Before Columbus Foundation. Let me bring up Gundar Strauss. Gundars. Sorry, I was just sitting down in the front row, and I was saying, after 44 years, I'm sort of missing the stage, and I, so I talked my way on to here. Uh, I want to say uh, uh, a huge thanks to uh, Justin for uh, having taken over this role uh, and uh, when I was out of town and uh, moving and changing things. And uh, he, he's been more than capable. His, his able hands have uh, amazed me in a lot of ways. And uh, he cares as much as I do to the point of uh, uh, not getting any reward uh, for it other than people we love and care about uh, saying nice things about you. So anyway, uh, in, just wanted to say in the last uh, uh, you know, 44 years, we've had a lot of uh, great writers who are now great writers, uh, who this was their first time. And this is a uh, book by Leila Motley is also you know, a first time uh, effort, but with so much more to say. She's definitely a new voice that uh, we have. And we've, we've introduced a lot of new voices and a lot of them have gone on to bigger, better things. And uh, we get to be lucky enough to say, uh, yeah, we noticed. Uh, back when I remember I had to explain to people what multicultural meant. And uh, at a convention one year, a uh, woman came up to me and says, oh, multicultural. Oh, that's the thing this year, isn't it? As if uh, it's eventually going to go away, uh, like a TikTok video that uh, isn't viral anymore. Uh, but we're still here, and I'm glad I'm still here through all of what it's taken. And I want to, you know, thank all the great new writers uh, who have new voices. When you think you've heard it every everything, uh, you have it. Just like in music, you think you've heard it all, and something like Sonny Rollins comes along, and uh, it 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 changes the whole scene, and it inspires other people to come back and write. Take a look at how many people sit there and mention their uh, mentors, the people who guided them, who gave them a chance. And uh, we're hoping to do that here too, to make sure that 
everybody uh, who wants to could get a chance to shine. And uh, that's all I have to say for now. But, uh, uh oh, Ishmael's taking a picture of me. I better get off. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank all the writers, too, uh, who could come and those who couldn't come. I know it's difficult right now these times. So, but. Uh, all right, let's hear it for Leela Motley and Gundar Strauss. <laughs> Thanks, Gundars. Oh, wow. You know, while we're telling sort of our origin stories, uh, I should say this. I, I know if you see me talk at the American Book Awards, I say this sort of a lot, but th it means something. Because I was a, an MFA candidate at Wash U. I, when I uh, finished off at Harvard, I, I went to Wash U because there was one writer I wanted to be like, and that was Stanley Elkin. And he was a Jewish American comic writer, and he was the guy I wanted to be. And I remember writing stories, and I write a lot of stories about Filipinos. And Stanley said, who are these people? And they all, well, can't you write a story without Filipinos? And it astonished me. I thought, well, maybe I can. Maybe I could write blankless, invisible type people and write their stories. But there was a visiting lecturer there at St. Louis at the time, and the man's name was Ishmael Reed. And when I told him what Stanley told him, that Stanley wanted me to take the Filipinos out, Ishmael said, put those Filipinos back in, Emil. What are you talking about? And that really changed my, the arc of my narrative and the people I write about and the people I care about in a literary way. And it's because of that, I dropped out of the MFA program and I went into TV broadcasting. And, but that's all right, that's all right. That's another kind of narrative arc and narrative storytelling. But it was because I could talk about Filipinos and TV, and I always thought Ishmael was the person who pushed me in that direction. So I, I thank you, my teacher, Ishmael Reed. <laughs> all right, uh, our next uh, person that we honor is Daryl Pinckney. He wrote the book, Come Back in September, A Literary Education on West 67th Street in Manhattan. Uh, he, of course, is not present, so that's why I'm presenting the award. Uh, Daryl Pinckney is a longtime contributor to the New York Review of Books, um, the author of two novels, High Cotton, 1992, Black uh, uh, Deutschland, 20, 2016, and several works of nonfiction. He uh, arrived at Columbia University in New York City in the early 1970s. And I guess he took, he got off the one and went the right way and was in Columbia, because if you go the wrong way on 116th, you end up in Harlem. But Daryl, uh, from, from there, went on to an illustrious literary career. We honor him today with the American Book Award. Come back in September, a literary education on West 67th Street, Daryl Pinckney. I was just in New York and Man, it's strange there, because inclusion, this whole thing isn't just about literature. It's all about art and everything else. I went to the Met, because that's where you meet your old friends, at the Met. And my friend said, let us find some Filipino art here in the Met. And we looked for it. And we went to the guards. We went to the, the, the website. There was, there was one piece of Filipino art, and it was off in the mezzanine in a glass, you know, sort of box. It was a Santo Nino, a baby Jesus. So they had the baby Jesus and they had a Joseph and they were both the size, they were no bigger than this book. And they're the only representations of Filipino art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art currently. And we scoured the website, we asked the docents, we asked the guard, who happened to be a Filipino artist who had worked there for 27 years guarding the art that people really wanted to see. And she told me, I'm sorry, you're not gonna see any Filipino art. Maybe in the mezzanine you'll find that baby Santo Nino and the Joseph. And I was saddened by that. Right, right, they're, they're lucky. <laughs> I mean, I just, I couldn't believe that inclusion is, the problem of inclusion is pervasive, not just in literature, but in all the arts. 
Anyway, uh, so after we honor Daryl Pinkney, our next honoree is Cheryl Shinoda. Sherry Sh Shinoda wrote Mummy Eaters. She calls herself a poet and a pediatrician, a lover, a daughter, a mother, a friend, an Orthodox Christian. She says, as a pediatrician, Lady Doc, I'm trained in a human rights approach to medicine. My faith informs my practice of medicine. My practice of medicine informs my faith, and both inform my writing. She was born in Cairo. She lives near Los Angeles. She is a Coptic poet and a pediatrician, and we honor her today with her book, or for her book, Mummy Eaters, Sherry Shinoda, and accepting the award for Sherry, her friend, Sammy Gadala. Sammy? Hi. Um, Sherry couldn't make it today. It's such an honor to be here, so I'm just, uh, she asked me to read her statement for her. It is an absolute delight to be listed among such very good company, and I, am, I very much regret that family obligations prevent me from joining in person to celebrate with you. It is an immense honor to accept the American Book Award. My gratitude to the Before Columbus Foundation. I am thankful. I am so thankful. The mythology of ancient Egyptians was oriented not toward death, but toward resurrection. Mummification was an attempt to preserve the body, to buy time long enough for the soul to find itself, its own face in Aru, the field of reeds, the soul of the great river Nile, the virgin of heaven in the afterlife. This reverence for the human body as a, sac as a sacred matter was lost on the Europeans who in the 16th and 17th centuries ate mummies, Egyptian human remains, as medicine. Mummies were thought to contain the powerful life force of these foreign ancients. This strikes me as an apt metaphor for the consumption of later, later colonialism. Mummy Eaters follows the path of an imagined ancestor through mummification as she races her way to the afterlife before her body decomposes. Running parallel to her journey is the violation and desecration of, a, of the European practice of mommy eating. Mommy eating dehumanized and fetishized ancient Egyptians while ostracizing and demeaning than modern day Egyptians. This desecration sinks even deeper when you consider the importance of an incarnated body to the, Egypt, to the ancient Egyptians. They could not enter the afterlife without it. This book hinges on, the on a broad, unwritten question, which is, what would our past, including colonialism, or our future, dealing with existential crises like climate change or the threat of nuclear war, look like if we believed that the other was human? Would we still consume each other? In the words of Maya Angelou, quote, I believe in anger. Anger is like fire. It can burn out all the dross and leave some positive things. But what I don't believe in is bitterness. Forgiveness is imperative because you don't want to carry that weight around. Who needs to? And it will throw you down. It doesn't help you to live life. I don't make myself vulnerable if I can help it, unquote. Mommy Eaters is about silencing of people of color, of minorities, of the people who didn't get to write the, hist the history books. Throughout history into modern times, the Coptic tradition, which finds its root deep in the heart of ancient Egypt, has suffered much attempted silencing. By ult but ultimately, this is a book about processing marginalizing marginalization and working toward forgiveness. It is about learning to speak from silence. This book owes a great debt to the African Poetry Book Fund, the University of Nebraska Press, and especially to Kwame Dawes for superlative, sensitive editing. Always and forever, my love and gratitude rest on my family, both born and chosen, who sacrificed much to make space for my writing. My congratulations to my fellow award winners, and in the words of the Coptic greeting in funerals, at funerals, in commemoration of our ancestors, may, may we live and remember. Thank you. So go get the award. All right, I'll hear it again for Mummy Eaters, Mummy Eaters. All right, uh, our next award goes to Masab Abu Toha, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear, Poems from Gaza. 
he is not here, but he has sent a representative, Elaine Katzenberger, who is the chief executive and publisher of City Lights Books. Elaine, please. It's nice to be here again. I am one of the lucky people who is familiar with the American Book Award. I think this is the third time I've accepted an award for somebody here. So I'm a proud publisher and I'm always grateful to the Before Columbus Foundation. Um, Mossab was on his way here. Um, Mossab is a, he's from Gaza and uh, maybe some of you understand something about how difficult it is for a Palestinian, but especially a Gazan, to leave and come to the United States. It's very complicated. Um, there was a Palestine Lit Festival happening in Philadelphia where he was being uh, featured, and um, he was there and was on his way here, but unfortunately had to go back to Gaza because um, things are happening over there, and the, there was a threat of the border uh, between Egypt and Gaza closing, and he would be stuck outside. So he wasn't able to come, and he's quite disappointed. Um, but he did write something last night and sent it to me, and um, I'm going to read that to you. It starts with a quote from his book of poems. Um, this is one of the poems that seems to move people a great deal because it's a poem about resilience, basically. Um, these four lines, don't ever be surprised to see a rose shoulder up under the rubble of the house. This is how we survived. And he adds here, and don't ever be surprised to hear us speak from under the rubble of the refugee camp. This is how our stories never died. I write this letter late at night while the drones still were overhead in the Gaza skies, where even the heavy cloud cover can't serve to protect our ears. I write this letter on my laptop while there is no electricity it's been cut off for several hours. I'm honored to be published by City Lights, and it's especially significant for me since the city I was born and raised in has been dark at night since 2007, the year that Israel imposed a brutal siege which began with the bombing of the only power plant in Gaza. The past 16 years have been harsh. About 70% of the population here in Gaza are refugees and their descendants. I come from a family that was expelled from Jaffa in 1948. I've never been there, but Jaffa is my home. I named my six-year-old daughter Jaffa after my family's city, the place that all four of my grandparents were unable to return to before dying. Despite the occupation and siege, I've managed to find a way. Through poetry, I rebuild Gaza, the city of my birth, and liberate Jaffa, my grandfather's city, I open its doors and windows to the migrating birds and the tired cats, dogs, and hens. The pages of my notebook are open lands planted with flowers and trees whose roots have been watered by rain from clouds that predate all of this. But this land is also stuffed with unexploded bombs that go off whenever the politics of greed and denial is discussed. Though our voices are usually silenced, we continue to speak not because our stories are so unique, but because our wounds have not closed. We are still bleeding. I want to thank the Before Columbus Foundation for recognizing my book of poems with an American Book Award. It is a great honor to join the list of this year's awardees and the list of so many of my heroes, especially Edward Said, Amiel Alcalay, and Audre Lorde. I wish I could be there with all of you in San Francisco and accept my award in person, but life is always very complicated for a Gazan. This time, I was actually able to get out of Gaza and attend a literary conference on the East Coast. I was about to set off for California when the threat of a sudden closure of the border crossing between Gaza and Egypt meant that I could get stuck outside, away from my family, and so I was forced back. To be a Gazan is to be unable to plan anything, sometimes even something as simple as arranging a Zoom call or recording a video and sharing it with others. To be a Gazan is to be unable to do much at all of what so many others take for granted. Huge thanks to my publisher and editor at City Lights, Elaine Katzenberger, who agreed to read my acceptance speech to you today, and also to the wonderful team at City Lights, Stacy, Natalie, Chris, and all of the people who keep it going. 
Again, thank you for honoring me with this award, and I hope to meet each one of you in person at other wonderful occasions to come. Masa Babu Toka. Thank you very much. All right, one more time for, for our winner. And Elaine, thank you very much. All right, our, our next winner, we're just going to go move along. Uh, uh, Javier Zamora wrote Solito, which is a memoir. He was born in El Salvador in 1990. When he was six years old, his father fled El Salvador for, uh, due to the U.S.-funded Salvadoran Civil War. Uh, his adventure is a 3,000-mile journey from his hometown. We honor him for his memoir, Solito, Javier Zamora. So next, uh, let's see. Uh, I welcome back Justin Demang, who accepts the award for the Anti-Censorship Award, is Netta C. Crawford for the Pentagon, Climate Change and War, Charting the Rise and Fall of U.S. Military Emissions. Uh, Netta is also the author of Accountability for Killing, Moral Responsibility for Collateral Damage in America post 9-11 uh, 2013, uh, it was published, uh, and so the Anti-Censorship Award, Netta C. Crawford for the Pentagon, Climate Change and War, Charting the Rise and Fall of U.S. Military Emissions and Accepting is Justin Demang. Before we talk very briefly about Nita Crawford's book, I want to return uh, to Daryl Pinckney because his book is just that good. And uh, that was very brief, no disrespect, Emil. I know. Right. want to keep it moving. Oh, sure, no, go ahead. But I'm going to uh, say a little bit more about Daryl uh, Pinckney's book, and I'm uh, going to urge you all to read it. And uh, this citation. For Come Back in September, A Literary Education on West 67th Street, Manhattan. And uh, Daryl uh, actually couldn't be with us today because he is in England, as was Ms. Bonwu, Ayana Bonwu. So before we get to uh, Nita Crawford's anti-censorship, uh, let me read this citation, stepping back a bit to uh, Daryl's wonderful book. How fortunate we are to have Daryl Pinckney's love so generously offered in these pages. Elegant, vivacious, supremely confident, and yet beguilingly vulnerable. To immerse oneself as a reader into Come Back in September is to submerge into a great river of longing and wonder of knowledge itself. The sparks, the fire, the eventual enveloping inferno of knowing, the lucky and unlucky happenstance, seemingly random intersections of occurrence, becoming synchronicity, producing flames of knowledge burn everywhere. As readers, we are invited into a very private and intimate space of close talk and even closer kinship. Pinckney's gifts as a writer are in such abundance throughout. The prose is almost luxurious in its splendor. Reading with an open heart, we are welcomed to a world of luminous discovery unfolding in the mind of a young man at the beginning of intellectual adventure. Getting to... Uh, the Anti-Censorship Award, it's an, it's an infrequent award. We don't give it out every year. Uh, but this was very important. I'm sure most of you agree that attention <laughs> on the Department of Defense, since they're spending your money, you don't mind, right? That's 50% of discretionary spending in the federal budget, all right? So the last... You know, the one that we're, we're currently spending, right, was nearly a trillion dollars. And who did they name it after? Why, well, they named the defense budget after, 
Mr. Enhoff, Mr. James Enhoff of Oklahoma, who you probably remember once threw a snowball on the floor of the Senate to prove that the global warming didn't exist. Yes, he stood there in 2009 and threw a snowball on the floor of the Senate and said, how can the global warming exist? It's snowing outside in Washington, D.C. So the largest uh, polluter, the one who's responsible for the greatest number of uh, carbon emissions uh, in the world today on the planet uh, is the Department of Defense, right? Over 700 military bases in your name. 270 gallons of fuel are burnt by the Department of Defense every second. 970,000 gallons of fuel per hour. 23 million gallons of fuel per day. The Air Force is the consumer of the largest Department of Defense fuel and expends 85% of its annual budget to deliver the fuel, of which only 6% is part of their annual budget. And more than 75% of the Department of Defense fuel today is used for transporting and conveying fuel prior to its final destination. And as I mentioned, the Department of Defense is the largest institutional consumer of energy worldwide. And vis-a-vis -vis the Paris Accords and other climate agreements, although uh, the Congress and uh, your favorite uh, <laughs> newscasters and folks on the uh, editorial pages didn't bother to mention, uh, they don't have to report their emissions vis-a-vis uh, -vis these, these climate agreements. They're given a loophole so they don't have to talk about what they do. 270 gallons of fuel per second globally. Students of history uh, will recall the oft-quoted January 17th, 1961 speech by Eisenhower where he warns of the military-industrial complex, but it was during those very hours that Patrice Lumumba was assassinated and Eisenhower was very enthusiastic about that. As a matter of fact, as he's delivering his speech, they're killing Lumumba and Frank Carlucci is driving the car with Lumumba's body, the man who would later form the Carlisle Group, an investment consortium led by George Herbert Walker Bush So this reveals some of the Jekyll and Hyde character, not only of United States foreign policy, but of uh, all of us here. And what it is we say about ourselves and what it is that the United States government is actually doing. Now, very few people obviously uh, are willing to take on the task of confronting this particular issue, particularly since the lion's share of the budget every year goes to the Department of Defense. And I never heard an argument about that on the floor of the Senate, did you? Billions of dollars are spent trying to convince you and I that the two parties are at each other's throats. And indeed, there are issues at which are they are in complete discord. The fact that child poverty rose it doubled in the last year, is unquestionably attributable to the intransigence of the Republican Party. But when it comes to spending money at the Department of Defense, there's absolute unanimity. There, there, there's no debate about that. And so these are some of the uh, reasons and reasonings that informed our decision at Before Columbus to, prevent the anti, uh, to, to present the anti-censorship award uh, to Nita Crawford, who uh, couldn't be with us today. She also, like Daryl, is in England teaching at Oxford University, but she did send uh, this message. Thank you for this honor. The military has understood climate change very well. Indeed paid for significant research in the field since the 1950s, but although the Pentagon is the United States' single largest energy user, the military have not looked at their emissions as a contribution 
to climate change, the reference I was making to their loophole that they don't have to report in the Paris Accords and other agreements. I write because I believe that good arguments can make a difference and challenge the accepted wisdom and offer alternatives. And again, thank you and know that I am honored to be in such good company, Nita Crawford. So before uh, bringing Tonya Foster to the stage, I wanna say a few words about the woman we honor with uh, the Walter and Lillian Lowenfels Criticism Award. Many of you know, uh, but it's not certainly well known, uh, that Bell Hooks actually began in publishing as a poet. And in fact, her, her first book, a chat book, and there we wept, was distributed by the Before Columbus Foundation long before the American Book Award, going back to the late 1970s. Small book, chat book, published by Golemics. During Bell Hook's lifetime, one of the uh, very few honors that she received was the American Book Award in 1991 for yearning race, gender, and cultural politics. Now, I spoke earlier about honesty, you know, the veracity of writers who deal with themselves and illuminate our world thusly. Bell Hooks was one of the most courageous in this regard, a woman of tremendous uh, courage and fortitude. And the light of her mind, the light of her mind, which continues to illuminate some of the darkest corners of American life and around the world. And one of the very, very few in uh, the academic world to call out other academics on their failures <laughs> to uh, remain in some uh, kind of sonance or harmony uh, with uh, the masses of black and dark-skinned people who continue under d duress, state-sponsored murder, and uh, she paid a dear price for that. So uh, I'm very happy uh, to welcome poet and educator Tonya Foster to accept the award for Bell Hooks and uh, to offer some more insight and some more description of uh, this extraordinary theoretician, poet, and writer who we honor today. So uh, please welcome Tonya Foster. I want to begin, uh, one, Justin, thank you for this invitation. Um, it's an honor to stand here and acknowledge and celebrate bell hooks. Um, one of the things that happened shortly before I got this invitation was I taught a class, and on this particular day, I teach six hours. And so there's a class I'm teaching called Feminist Imaginaries. And I came home, and for some reason, I kept thinking about bell hooks. And I thought, well, you know, what's going on? So I, I, there's a quote of hers that I had about interdependence. And there was some point in that day, I was in my graduate class, I said, we're gonna pause for a minute, and I wanna know how you are. And the students kind of looked at me like, I said, well, let's talk about what you're bringing with you in this study of feminist imaginaries, in part because the idea of compartmentalization of the various ways we have of knowing 
are actually <laughs> tools for organizing us, for separating us, and for disallowing precisely what Hooks called for, was, which was that the work of the institution or within these academic spaces needed to also be work that happened outside those spaces. Um, and so I just, I wanted to start there. And so I got home and I sent this quote from Hooks to the students, not clear on why she was on my mind. And it was her birthday, it turned out. Um, and shortly after, I think the next day, I got an email from Harriet Mullen saying, Tanya, has Justin DeMongs sent an email to you to ask you to accept this award for, <laughs> for Bell Hooks? I'm like, no, but I'm so glad to hear from you, Harriet. And immediately after Justin's email came. And so there was a, there was a kind of beautiful at least in my mind, synchronicity um, that, that had space in the classroom and in my own thinking about hooks. Now, I'd like to start with a poem of hers from Appalachian Elegy, uh, Poetry and Place, number six. Listen, little sister, angels make their hope here in these hills. Follow me, I will guide you. Careful now, no trespass, I will guide you. Word for word, mouth for mouth. All the holy ones embracing us, all our kin, making home here, renegade marooned, lawless fugitives, grace these mountains. We have earth, to bind us. The covenant between us can never be broken. Vows to live and let live. This is a poem written by Bell Hooks, whose given name was Gloria Jean Watkins. In a 2017 interview with Silas House, she responds to House's questions about an Erica Young quote. To change one's name is the first act of the poet and the revolutionary. Now, Hooks responds to this. Well, I respond to that quote by, you know, recognizing that names have power. And the name I was born with really does. Gloria Jean, given to me, really reflects how much my parents wanted me to be a very feminine Southern Belle type girl. And I think that in order to find my voice and use it, I had to use the name of my great grandmother on a maternal side, Belle Hooks, in order to bring a self into being that my parents and my home were not nurturing. She goes on to explain why she chose, of course, not to capitalize her chosen name. Well, you know, people forget that early on in the late 60s and early 70s, especially among people engaged with feminism, there was all of this talk about getting rid of the ego. You know, we weren't just engaged with feminism, we were engaged in all these Eastern religions, sexual liberation, and the whole idea of divorcing oneself from the ego. Paying attention to who is speaking was, you know, politically incorrect. The point was to listen to what people were saying. So lots of people in those days engaged with feminism, used pseudonyms of, or different names. In my case, you know, and, and she goes on in this terrific essay, but, or interview rather. Now, in contradistinction to the American cult of competition, Hooks as critic, 
as theorist, as poet, as feminist, as being, as mensch, navigating a world on fire and in distress, calls on us in our shifting and varied configurations, she calls on us, she says we have to be aware of the extent to which liberal individualism has actually been an assault on community. When the genuine staff of life is our interdependency, is our capacity to feel both with and for ourselves and other people. She asserts that the true work of love, and later in her life she, she said that she had become a kind of priestess of love, but the true work of love is just so hard. It requires integrity that there be a congruency between what we think, say, and do. She, huh, bell hooks though gone on as we say where I'm from, still insists through the over 30 books and the various recorded lectures, through all the students she taught directly and indirectly, on a she insists on a continuous refusal of the easy and murderous compartmentalizations that marketing and branding demand. We are multiple and various. Even within the selves we are told to think we are. Thank you, Belle, nay Gloria, for insisting that we attend to the material and ethical possibilities and consequences of our theories, of our figurations, of our critical and creative articulations. Thank you. One more time for Tanya Foster for Bell Hooks. <clears throat> You know, I didn't realize that Bell Hooks wasn't her real name, and like uh, use of pen names is very common. I used the, the term amok, A-M-O-K, because it means uh, to be thrust in a mur murderous frenzy, uh, which is a great metaphor for, for me. But I learned something this, this pandemic. I, uh, I went to, I finished med school this pandemic, yeah. uh, meditation school. And I, I learned to control a sense of that anger that I had, and uh, the final awardee, uh, I've been listening a lot to her audible book, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, where that, that means I get to listen to Maxine Hong Kingston talk me to sleep at night. And it, it has sort of changed my, my direction or my feeling about what my words mean. And so uh, our last award is the Lifetime Achievement Award, and to introduce the winner, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, let me introduce Colleen Lai, the Associate Professor of English at UC Berkeley, who will introduce our award winner. Colleen. So, hi everybody. Um, thanks for staying. Sean Wong was meant to be here today to introduce the winner of this Lifetime Achievement Award, but he came down with COVID, um, and so I'm here in his place. Why me? I'm actually one of those pesky critics of literature, not a creator of literature, and my only claim to fame is that I walk the same halls of a building that Maxine Hong Kingston taught in, as well as Ishmael Reed for many years, that is, at the English department at UC Berkeley. Now, Reed, of course, founded the Before Columbus Foundation in 1976, and 1976 was also the year that Kingston published her first book, as you'll soon hear about. So now, 47 years later, we've come full circle. So now I'm just gonna read you what Sean was going to say, because his words are beautiful. Pretend I'm Sean now. In the in the early 70s, you could count the number of books in print 
written by Asian American writers on one hand, and we certainly did not occupy a seat at the big table of American literature. Our published books had gone out of print, and the writers lived a life of obscurity. No one had read John Okada's No No Boy, Louis Chu's Eat a Bowl of Tea, or the short stories of Hisei Yamamoto and Toshio Mori. And then an astounding thing happened in 1976. Maxine Hong Kingston published The Woman Warrior, and the critical and commercial success of the book meant for many Asian American writers working the margins that someone had at least moved a chair closer to the big table. Since that time, Maxine Hong Kingston has won nearly every literary award available. One might say the Before Columbus Foundation is a little late to the party, or for the kind of guest that doesn't know when to leave the party and stays too late. Whatever the case, I look at it as an award given to a writer by writers, which makes us different. I've been using one of Maxine Hong Kingston's book in my classes at the University of Washington for years, and that's her novel, Trip Master Monkey, his fake book. It hasn't received the kind of notice her, books, her other books have. Why is that? It's a novel about literary Asian America. Had Kingston published a novel about literary New York, critics would have lauded its publication because it would have confirmed what everyone perceived as the literary canon that didn't include us. I remember telling one of my graduate students when the book came out in 1989 that it was still possible to read every Asian American book in print in America and it would have taken her just a few weeks to do so. Kingston's main character in that book, Whitman Ah Sing, is a Chinese American writer. And if you know Asian American literature and its writers, you were able to read Trip Master Monkey and recognize who many of the people were in the story or know the origins of some of the stories. Karen Yamashita in her novel, I Hotel, another novel about literary Asian America, calls Kingston the godmother of Asian American literature. So true. The Before Columbus Foundation is here to not just celebrate a writer and her books, but a member of the family who tells our story and we can say, there I am in this book. Thank you, Maxine, for giving us a seat at the table of American literature. Thank you, everybody. This award means a lot to me, uh, especially that it was presented by Sean Wong. Uh, this means that there is some rapprochement coming uh, be among writers who were arguing who do those stories belong to and who is authentic? In other words, who is true? And, uh, and, and on this level, who is a Chinese? And who is Chinese American? And for Sean and I, we were on opposite sides of this argument. And uh, so his words today means that there is rapprochement, if not reconciliation. Um, okay, a thousand years before Columbus, Chinese ships sailed here and they came to Turtle Island. And uh, in, th in those days, the Chinese exploration ships carried, they carried artwork. They brought the culture of the Middle Kingdom as far as they could go. So those ships were loaded with sculptures and scrolls and paintings 
musical instruments, drums, compasses, and, uh, and, and when they got here to Turtle Island, the culture that they found here, that they received, was, um, was this was a land that, where women were the most powerful. It actually, here they came to Turtle Island, but they called it the land of women. And, and what impressed them was there was no war and no taxes. Okay, then, uh, there, maybe about 30 years ago, Earl and I were uh, uh, living at the Grand Canyon, and we went to visit the Hopis, and, um, and, and oh, one of the Hopi women was showing us around, and I, I thought, look, look, up there. They, they have curved roofs, and in the curved roofs, there are uh, uh, ceramic or clay uh, sculptures of animals and people, and they're traveling on these curved roofs. And I said, oh, we have those too. And, uh, and then she said, well, what village do you come from? Or what tribe are you from? I, I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I, I'm talking about China. And, uh, and she said, oh, we came from there uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, we came across five rocks. And, I, and then I said, wow. Uh, five rocks, maybe uh, the islands of Hawaii, and then they got here. Uh, and then years later, I, uh, uh, in, in, in China, I saw uh, Everywhere, you could find these everywhere. They're sculptures. Uh, I think they're made out of bronze or iron, and, and they're turtles. And uh, they, they, actually they look like uh, uh, Volkswagen bu bugs. They're about that same size. And, uh, and on their backs is a, a Stella and uh, and on, on, on these stellas, on the backs of the turtles, there's poems, and what they say is that turtles, turtles brought writing uh, to China. And, uh, and so, so, I think, wow. I'm looking at these uh, at at these roofs, both in China and at Hopi, and I think, well, there's there, we must have gotten together somewhere, and then a few years ago, maybe maybe about. 30 years ago, this was in the 1980s, and the Cultural Revolution was just ending. And uh, I was traveling with um, Leslie Marmon Silco through China. Oh, Toni Morrison was there too. We were, we were traveling together and uh, and, to, and uh, Leslie was wearing uh, 
a poncho, and uh, it had all kinds of Laguna Indian uh, designs on it. And, and then we were looking at, um, at rugs in China, and, uh, and she looks at them, and she says, wow! And she holds up her poncho, she holds up the rug, and it's, it's the same designs, the same symbols. And, and so she bought one of those rugs, and, she, and she's going to bring it back. Uh, and then we were at a, uh, a, a, a temple, and uh, there, there's these columns. And uh, the columns were a turquoise blue and uh, uh, Chinese red with white trims. And Leslie says, wow. And then she goes like this, and you see her earrings dangling down, and they're the same as those columns. And so then we looked at each other, and we're saying, wow. And then we're saying, yeah, there was a rainbow bridge. And the Rainbow Bridge is a two-way street. And so, anyway, that just shows how we are connected. Or even as bell hooks, the Buddhists would say, we are one. Uh, and Shakespeare reminds us that kin and kindness and kind come from the same roots. Oh, as living treasure of Hawaii, aloha. Thank you, Maxine, and congratulations for the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I know that because I read, uh, I love a broad margin to my life. A writer doesn't die until they're, they run out of words, right? You're going to keep, the, the next book is coming out soon, right? We hope, we hope. Anyway, uh, that was our last award. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for those of, of you at home watching. Remember the Before Columbus Foundation in your will and your donations. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you for these uh, 44th anniversary awards. We will be back next year. Keep reading, keep writing, keep fighting for diversity and inclusion. My name is Emil Guillermo. Thank you very much. <laughs>